number of people will arrive late, but we have a little bit of trivia to go through anyway. Uh, is there, how many people were here yesterday? Good heavens. Well, it doesn't matter because we're not going to repeat ourselves. If anybody who was here yesterday is burning to acquire the software for the time wave, I still have three order blanks left. So I don't know how you can struggle over them or something. Do you need one? Here it is. Anybody else? Here's one. And here's the last one. I'm sort of short on all my propaganda here. There are probably enough of these so that most people or most people and some couples can have them. This is just my schedule for the rest of the year and next. If any of you are interested in the botanical project, um, there's just a few of these descriptors left of botanical dimensions. So we'll pass these as far as they'll go. Why don't we start them at the back of the room so there's an element of fairness in all this. Does somebody want to come up and start these up from the back? And then uh, more appropriately to today's subject, uh, I finally put aside my better judgment and accepted an offer to be to lead a tour of Upper and Lower Egypt next December. So if you're interested in ancient Egypt or Hermeticism or uh, the grotesque humor that arises from watching people from Southern California <laughs> cavort in the shadow of the Great Pyramid, then you <laughs> won't want to miss this one. No, it'll be more, if, if we get our friends, it'll be much more fun than if we have to, you know, listen to that lady from Glendale who channels Attila the Hun. <laughs> I hope she's not listening. I've never known her to listen, so. All righty, right. Um... I'm surprised that there's so much overlap. How many people weren't here yesterday? So these are people with a specific focus of interest on hermeticism. Is that true? Uh-huh. Oh, so you didn't need that again, right? <laughs> well, uh, all of these things... Oh. Here are my gloves. How did they get loose? All of these things are, uh, it all relates to each other, at least in the seamless mush that my mind has become. Okay, is there anything left over then from yesterday that anybody over the course of 16 hours is burning to, yeah. did I get that in, Dave? Well, it was interesting. I realized lying in bed last night going over the day that I hadn't really discussed um, the, the correlations, the exterior support for the 2012 date. The way I aligned the time wave was simply by having a list of what I thought were the high novelty points in the last couple of thousand years and then fitting the thing against it. And then when I would get what looked like a good fit, where all the things I, on my list were in high novelty positions, then I would tr expand the list and see if it still fit. 
and what I was, and then I, in the early phases, I was interested, I had this sort of intuition, or the logos told me that um, every cycle should begin with uh, a bang, literally, and that this bang was uh, the reson the trickle-down resonance of the big bang, and I gained support for this idea from although to call this a source of support, from Finnegan's Wake, <laughs> where, you know, there are instances of what is called Viconian thunder, these huge thunderous words that begin every new section of the wake. So I thought that I should uh, look at big bangs, and when I looked at the 20th century and was trying to figure out where to start the cycle of the last, uh, of this presumably last, but in any case, 67 year, 104.25 day cycle, where to start it in the 20th century, um, the big bang that I settled on was Hiroshima, August the 5th, 1945. And if you add 67 years, 104.25 days to that, uh, you come very, very close to this December 22nd, 2012 date, plus everything else seemed to fit. And then what, for me, made it more persuasive was that um, after this was all completed and pretty much set in concrete in my mind, someone pointed out to me that uh, the Mayan calendar ends on that precise date, that day. And this is a, you know, you can call it a peculiar coincidence, but this whole realm is fraught with coincidence. Um, The list was simply sort of what you know if you have a good liberal education. In other words, you know the Golden Age of Greece, the Italian Renaissance, the European Enlightenment, and the 20th century. And then you begin looking at the fine detail based on that. When I first began, I thought that, that the discovery of relativity was it. But that would have made the grand finale occur in 1973. <laughs> Let me tell you a story just so you can see how peculiar this is. Uh, yes, so I fastened in on the theory of relativity. And, uh, and I calculated f forward that uh, to try and find the end date. And it ended on the winter solstice of, uh, of uh, 1973. And uh, I thought that was moderately interesting. It was when you propagated it forward two of these 384-day things. So then I went to uh, the Astronomical Library at Cal and looked up in the ephemeris of eclipses and I discovered that on this uh, uh, f winter solstice of 1973, there would be a total eclipse of uh, the sun. And I thought that that was interesting. These accumulated, that's what you look for, is accumulations of density of coincidence. And uh, they publish in these astronomical atlases uh, all the eclipses all the eclipses of the next thousand years and the past thousand years, and they publish maps of the tracks of all of these eclipses. So I, um, I looked up the track of the eclipse of December 22nd, 1973, and it uh, started, I think, out in the Pacific Ocean somewhere. At totality, it swept across La Chorrera, and it, it completed itself in the delta of the Amazon over the city of Berlin, which is a big river city in the Amazon. Well, I thought, I looked at this, and I, as an amateur scholar of Joyce, I was aware 
that the delta symbol for Joyce was always the vagina. There's that whole geometry lesson in Finnegan's Wake that has to do with the inverting of the triangles, which is actually this obscene thing that he's going through. So I knew that the delta was the symbol of the vagina, and then I saw that this eclipse ended in the delta of the Amazon. And then I thought, of course, the delta of the Amazon, the world mother, the Amazon is, you know, the largest female geographical feature on the planet. And here we had a total eclipse of the sun on a winter solstice completing itself at Berlin. And Berlin is uh, the Portuguese word for Bethlehem. You see, I was seriously, it was called delusion of reference, this, <laughs> this condition. So, uh, and I thought, wow, far out. Uh, we, uh, now we have the answer to Yeats' question. Do you know what Yeats' question was? What rough beast is it that slouches toward Bethlehem to be born? And so I was all quite keen on all of this. Now, as if that weren't strange enough, whatever is, whenever somebody comes up with something like that, the desperate argument of the pseudo-rationalists when really slammed to the wall is that this information was known, it was published in books, these eclipse tracts, these ephemerides, and so forth. It was all published in books, and consequently, uh, you didn't predict the future. You merely tap, merely <laughs> tapped into the sum total of the human database already existent, and your unconscious has taken all these clues and all this data and woven it together into a delusion, which is designed to suck you in and trap you. Well, this is a hard argument to overcome. The only way that you could overcome that argument is that if you predicted an event that was non-repeating and that nobody on Earth knew it was going to happen or could possibly know that it's going to happen uh, at the time you make the prediction. So I was in the early months of 73 and the late months of 72 running around telling everybody that uh, this winter solstice with an eclipse over the delta of the Amazon was going to be of cosmic uh, importance. Well then, about um, March of 1973, I was reading my uh, morning paper, and on page four, there was this large headline, and it said, Brightest Comet Yet Headed Toward Earth. And I was reading this thing, and it said, you know, this object will reach perihelion, meaning closest approach to the sun, on December 22nd of this year. This was the comet Kohotek. Well, now, the interesting thing about Kohotek was it didn't amount to much, but I had, pre I had predicted its window of appearance before it was detected by human beings or instruments anywhere on the planet. So it was just from the mushroom to me like a perfect proof that it was giving information that couldn't come from the human unconscious, couldn't come from any calculation of past events that a unique long period comet never before seen and probably never to be seen again was going to fall right smack in the center of my window of uh, predictive intensity. So, you know, it's just an instance of the cosmic giggle. I mean, in terms of of what does it mean? It's like, you know, when that question was posed to Mr. Natural, he said, it don't mean shit. <laughs> and, but isn't it strange? <clears throat> well, that's enough of that. That's just to, yeah. Um, how would you relate, I mean, do you have any, do you see any
well, morphogenetic fields, the theory that lies behind the I Ching, all of these things are attempts to make a statement about the frontier of understanding. And to the degree that, in other words, it's like there's a perception which wants to be born, but it is, since it's at the edge of cognitive revelation, it's very hard to get it right. I mean, the I Ching, morphogenetic fields, the tarot, uh, the time wave that we looked at yesterday, these are all uh, attempts to encompass within a metaphor something which is at present almost unsayable. It's very interesting, if you care about this kind of thing, to go back uh, into the history of the evolution of ideas and see what it is like, what the ideological climate is like, right before an idea crystallizes and is finally gotten straight, or pretty straight. Uh, an area where that happened that I spent some time poking around in is um, immediate, you know, the 15 years preceding Darwin's publication of The Origin of Species and uh, Alfred Russell Wallace's paper to the Royal Society in London, all of biology in England and Germany and on the continent, all of biology was intensely involved with what the literature of the time called the problem of the species. And, you know, they were, all these people were exploring various parts of the world, especially the tropics. They could see that if you go from one Indonesian island to another, there is shift of species. There are slightly modified forms. In other words, they had all the ingredients in front of them on the table, and people were trying to figure it out, but it w they didn't quite have it. And then it crystallized in the minds of certain people. For Alfred Russell Wallace, who is the real discoverer of natural selection, it, it sort of relates to our theory of creativity. He had malaria on the island of Ternate, north of... Um, the Malukas, or in the North Malukas. And in the fifth day of this intense malarial fever, he saw the solution to the problem of the species. And he, uh, he wrote it down in this fevered state. And then he worked his way through this illness. And when he came down and, and looked at what he'd written, he couldn't find fault with it. It seemed right. It's just a page and a half. It's preserved. It's all there. So he didn't know what exactly to do. So he decided he would write a letter to the greatest uh, naturalist, natural scientist of the age, who was uh, the aristocratic and well-connected Charles Darwin back in England. By this time, Wallace had been six years knocking around in the forests of Indonesia. So he sends this letter to Darwin. Darwin had been working on the origin of species for nearly 18 years. This letter arrives in the post. He opens it up and he just says, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, who is this guy? <laughs> Some surveyor from Wales has uh, beaten me to the punch, you know. And so he... he um, I don't suppose he got on the phone, but he sent a message with a servant to uh, Charles Lyell, who was his great friend and the, chair and the president of the Royal Society at that time, and said, you know, Charlie, this is a real problem. I'm bringing this book out. This guy, some clown, this guy looks like he scooped me. And Lyell said, don't worry, here's what we'll do will get him to deliver a paper at the Royal Society and will have you deliver a paper the same evening. And you know how everybody adjourns to get drunk at the intermission, so we'll just schedule him after the intermission. And this was done. 
And this is why Charles Darwin is the discoverer of evolution. For a few decades, it was called the Darwin-Wallace theory, but uh, eventually, it's an interesting story, although not relevant to what we're doing, but uh, what overturned, well, somewhat relevant, the reason, Dar the reason Wallace became persona non grata in English science was because he would not genuflect before pure reductionism. He said there is more to evolution than mutation and natural selection. There is a spiritual element, and that was all it took for him to get the boot, because 19th century scientific theory in biology was absolutely uh, phobic of deism, belief in God. They were really far more committed atheists than I would wager most of us are. It was a point of pride with them to squeeze spiritual assumptions out of all of their theories. There is no purpose recognized in, in Darwinian evolutionary theory. To speak of purpose in their minds was to completely misunderstand what was being suggested. And what they wanted was a theory of how life could evolve and come to be that would be specifically without purpose. Because the only kind of purpose they could imagine was God's plan. And they wanted to dump that whole idea. It was a very fierce intellectual struggle. As the inheritors of the victory, we don't really realize what a desperate struggle that was. I mean, as recently as 120 years ago, you could call yourself a member of the British intelligentsia, and you could believe that the Earth was created at 10 a.m. on September the 6th, uh, 2344 B.C. That was educated Christian opinion in England as recently as 120 years ago. So we have made considerable intellectual progress, at least. They calculated, they read the Bible, all those begats, you know, and the ages of each person, so-and-so lived to be 120 years, and he begat so-and-so, and they added it all up, and that was the date. Well, yeah. They, uh, they had an incredibly limited view of the possibility of cosmic time. This is an intellectual revolution that has taken place almost within our lifetimes. Uh, people had no idea how old the world was and how old human beings were. I mean, that was as far as the imagination of Western Europe could be stretched to the idea that the Earth was 4,500 years old. You know, in the, at the turn of the century, when these French peasants were out digging truffles or feeding their goats or something, and they fell into the hole that led to the Lascaux paintings, and they saw all these, you know, the bison and the deer and these amazing paintings, said, you know, this is really important. Let's get, let's tell the experts in Paris. So these, the great experts on, on uh, the art of Europe came and down and lowered themselves into this cave and viewed all this stuff and then announced to the Paris newspapers that uh, this stuff was not old, that in their expert opinion, these things had probably been done as a kind of uh, amusement by French soldiers in the Grand Army of Napoleon who overwintered there in 1812, you know. So they were saying it's basically less than 100 years old from their vantage point. These things were 20 to 25,000 years old. And as this dawned, this realization, this is the discovery of deep time. Uh, the idea that the, the Earth could be 4 billion years old, you know, these were astonishing intellectual revolutions of which we are the inheritors and we've 
sort of grown up with these assumptions, but they are very, very recent leaps in the evolution of the European uh, imagination. That's right. Oh, yeah. We're, we're a country of rattlesnake handling screwballs. Uh, I mean, it, every time I go to Europe, it amazes me. The great difference between Europe and the United States is uh, that they, it's a secular society over there. You know, they have transcended fundamentalism pretty thoroughly. And, uh, and so discussions about social mores or drugs or stuff like that can go on without invoking concepts like God's wrath and Jesus' plan and stuff where you just, oy vey, you know. <clears throat> anyway, enough of Sunday morning raving. Yes? On the time wave, it, how, how much can you say that the time wave actually relates to the individual? Particularly if you're getting down into our own time on the time wave. Can, can the individual, we didn't get that far down into the time wave yesterday. Right. yesterday. I, I take it that the time wave is actually fixed. Yes, Forever, right. right. Well, so the big wave, the wave we were looking at. The big wave is how much can it then relate to the individual in terms of, you know, if you, well, you take, if you zoom on down. Right. Down. That's an interesting question. I sort of feel, I, I see, and I've worked out the theory of how it could be applied to the individual, but I'm a little less comfortable with it. I don't hear the logos booming in my ears when I did that part of the work. Uh, astrology underwent a kind of similar uh, crisis, if you want to put it that way. Originally, astrology was to uh, chart basically the course of, of, king, of reigns of kings, and kings were assumed to be macrocosms of society. So really, astrology was created to chart the destiny of nations and peoples. In the Renaissance, uh, it, with the birth of the idea of the individual, really, people for the first time began to think of, well, what about my horoscope, you know? And really, I think the evolution of the personal horoscope, although I'm sure astrologers will rise in a single body to shout this down, but the rise of the individual horoscope is essentially a, uh, a capitalist uh, phenomenon where you then create a product that can be dealt. Because if you're only casting horoscopes for the court, pretty soon there aren't too many horoscopes needing to be cast. The way you do it with the time wave, if you want to get your individual wave, is uh, the way I think of the big wave that we looked at yesterday is that it uh, is, in a sense, the average of all the little waves, that we each are a little wave. And when you average them all together, you get the big wave, sort of the way if you have enough atoms of gold and you put them together pretty soon you have an ingot of gold and the ingot of gold has a different architecture than gold atoms but it's made of gold atoms anyway the way you do that for an individual is you take your birth date and you add 67 years 104.25 days that's one cycle you add that to your birth date, and you enter that as the end date, rather than December 22nd, 2012. You, you add that, you use that as the end date, and then you look back at your life. Now, what this implies is that age, at age 67 years, 104.25 days, uh, you have an excellent opportunity to die. <laughs> If you miss this opportunity, there won't be such a good opportunity as that for 67 more years. So you sort of have to, I don't know, I don't take this stuff seriously, and, and, and neither should you. <laughs> yes.
Well, in a way, what this is just showing you the architecture of the hologram, uh, you know how um, one of the interesting features of a hologram is when you cut a little piece out of it, you have the whole thing. You can cut a square out of the middle of a hologram, and when you illuminate that little square, the whole thing is still there. This is the magic of the hologram, that all of the information is distributed through each point on the hologram. And you can take that little square and cut a little square out of it and illuminate it, and the whole hologram will be there. Now, what you're losing in this is resolution. The, the, the uh, detail gets dimmer and dimmer, but the major outlines remain. This is a uh, quality of fractals. You see, information in a hologram is distributed according to what mathematicians call a Fourier transform. And when you analyze Fourier transforms, they turn out to be a kind of fractal. So uh, these resonances that I was showing you yesterday, where we see how the Third Reich relates to ancient Egypt and stuff like that, well, that's a very... That's a, that's a one-day course in the time wave version of how these resonances work. Really, there are, hundred, there are dozens of major re resonances and thousands of minor resonances that go in to making up a given moment. So if we were to like analyze this moment in high detail, we would build trees of resonances of less and less input but still present that would show us the situation in great complexity uh, because you know many many times are present all time ultimately if you draw the resonance trees out far enough you discover all time is present in every moment eternity in a grain of sand wasn't that William Blake's rap that's the bottom line of all of these theories, is that the whole history of the universe is contained, recapitulated, and, and somehow present in every moment, or every year, or every millennium, or every million years. It's a series of hologramized, refractive, fractalized uh, self-referentiality is what it is. Yeah. thing in its time. As, as sort of guidance in the work and so forth. Uh -huh. Each artist is guided if you're aware of his times and omens and symbols. Well, in a, I was, in a way, um, I was very interested in synchronicity in my youth. That's sort of what got me started reading Jung. But the more time I spent reading philosophy, and especially philosophy of science relative to time, I came to realize that synchronicity, as presented by Jung, is, is not an explanation of anything. It's the name of a phenomenon, but it is no explanation. In fact, it tells you there is no explanation. The explanation is there is no explanation. It's simply synchronicity. Uh, P.W. Bridgman in a book called The Theory of Natural Law, made a statement which has always guided me in this kind of model building. He said, a coincidence is what you have left over when you apply a bad theory. You see how that works?
Yeah, you have to be able to perceive almost schizophrenically. Almost. You have to see. I mean, you have to see. We were talking, or it's, his name has been bandied about this weekend, Philip K. Dick. What happened to Phil was that the resonance became stronger than the reality, or it became equal in strength, so that he, by squinting, he could see, you know, second century Rome. Everybody changed into people wearing togas and speaking demotic Greek and everything. Well, that was the resonance of where he was at. But when the resonance comes forward with such strength that the foreground is displaced, they have a name for that. Buggo. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> you know, you have you got to watch that. Um, on the other hand, if you can control it, it's a source of great richness and inner amusement uh, just to see, you know, somebody comes scrambling up who needs their book signed and you notice that, you know, who you've got at, uh, in front of you is uh, Charlie Chaplin or Adolf Hitler or some, you know, the, everyone has these people inside them and they come and go on the surface. I mean, you aren't who you think you are. You aren't even who you think you aren't. Uh, I mean, it's very, very tricky, yeah. So you could, you could check the intensity of novelty of the time. That's the idea, yeah, to map novelty. And it could be for a person. It can be done. Yeah, because see, here's the thing. If, if there were only one wave, then it would be my difficult task to explain to you why we aren't all always doing the same things at the same time. How can, for instance, imagine a situation where on the day people, uh, on the day people land on the moon, you lose your job. Well, how, how you haven't really shared in this wonderful forward step into new dimensions of freedom. Instead, you've been reduced to poverty, misery, and anxiety. How come it means that while the, the big wave was moving deeper into novelty, your personal wave was moving in the opposite direction? One of the great things, I think, is to have your own wave in sync or in resonance with the big wave. I've noticed that very strongly. Like I, I've been thinking for months and months that I needed to uh, get a better disk drive. So finally I look at my bank account and I decide, okay, it looks like I can just squeak through and I'll get this thing. So I buy it, I bring it home, I flip on NPR and they say, uh, Sales of durable goods are rising in a sure sign that the uh, recession is about to... I think, gee, I could have ended the recession months ago if I'd realized... <laughs> yes, yes. That's right. You're in a, all all cultures are embedded in this culture. I mean, on this island, you can find Amazonian Indians. You can find Sufi saints. You can find Satanists. You can. It's all here, probably within walking distance of where we're sitting. Uh, yeah, synchronicity, coincidence, all that stuff is very peculiar. I remember as a. This will be the last and. Uh, anecdote. I was uh, I was in a restaurant a few years ago in Malibu with a bunch of Hollywood people, and there was this woman there, this French woman, and she wasn't terribly hip, but she had been introduced by somebody to my shtick, and so we were all there, and she said, um, "This mushroom." Uh, you say that it speaks to you, but I don't understand speak. What do you mean? 
And I said, well, you know, it can take on various persona. For instance, uh, and thinking since she was a film producer, I should appeal to her industry. I said, remember the role that uh, Steiger played in The Pawnbroker? Well, sometimes the, the mushroom is, is like that. And at that moment, uh, Steiger leaned across the table to be introduced to everybody. And I... <sighs> so then we all shook hands with Rod Steiger. He went back to his table. And Ralph Abraham, who had been sitting across from this French woman and I, watching this whole thing, leaned over and said to me, you see, Terence, it's just the mushroom's way of showing you that it can reach out and touch you anywhere. Anyway, it, it is, it does, the mushroom is very much like Rod Steiger. <laughs> I, I said to it once, what, what are you doing? on this planet said listen you're a mushroom you live cheap <laughs> this was not such a bad neighborhood till the monkeys went nuts which is true actually all right we've probably staved off serious work just about as long as we can unless someone insists no okay well, today's thing is sort of a return to a more uh, orthodox, educational kind of mode, hopefully not to such a degree that it's boring. Uh, but um, the agenda is to talk about uh, hermeticism and alchemy, and the way in which this tradition, which is counterintuitive and... Uh, heterodox, if not heretical, from the point of view of Christianity, and, uh, you know, what it can mean for the present, what it means for the psychedelic experience, what it means for the notion of uh, the end of history, and how the loss of this point of view has probably done us uh, a certain amount of damage. The great tension in the Middle Ages was between uh, the late Middle Ages was between the um, magical schema the magical view of human beings and the um, Christian view and the Christian view is very strongly marked by the idea that uh, of man's fall that we screwed up early on and somehow then by virtue of that were forced into a secondary position in the cosmic drama we are doing penance as we speak the world is a veil of tears the lot of human beings is to till hard land and uh, you know we are cursed unto the 19th generation or something like that uh, by the fall of our first parents. Uh, and we can be redeemed. This is, I'm giving you the Christian rap. We can be redeemed through Christ, but we don't deserve it. It is, if you are saved, it is because there is a kind of... Um, A hand extended to you from a merciful God who is willing to overlook your wormy nature and draw you up in spite of yourself and this is deep in us no matter how uh, you know whether you're you may not think you've bought in because you're black or because you're Chinese or something but it's just in the air we breathe it's what Western civilization makes you think whether you want to think it or not. You know, even if you don't come out of these traditions, uh, for us, the concept of that you've got to pay your dues, that's what it comes down to. The idea that human beings are co-partners with deity in the project of being, 
This is the basis of all magic. You see, in a Christian context, magic is heresy because it implies that that uh, man can command God to act. In other words, that in some strange way, the magician compels nature to behave as the magician desires. Uh, in Hermeticism, it isn't so much put in terms of compel, but the idea is that, that uh, Humanity, human beings, men and women of great spiritual accomplishment are co-partners in the project of being. And that God, as it were, stepped off the stage of creation with it only 90% completed. And the rest is left in the hands of his brother, the Hermetica actually refers to humanity as the brother of God. So it's a completely different attitude toward being human. It's an empowering attitude. With power comes the potential to abuse power because you're no longer a worm. You remember that image in Jonathan Edwards' sermon, the sinners in the hands of an angry God, where he says you're... You're, you're like a worm suspended over an abyss, held there only by the, uh, the, the love of a merciful God, implying that if he weren't a merciful God, he'd just let go of your thread and you'd go down the tubes. Uh, in the hermetic magical view, human beings are not tainted by original sin. And no, no ideology is without the potential of abuse. Uh, the hermetic attitude in the Renaissance was summed up in a single aphorism by the great uh, Renaissance Platonist Marcello Ficino. And what he said was, and I have to, you know, I, I, there's no sexism in all of this. You just have to realize these guys were primitive types and they hadn't confronted uh, the, poli the political issues we've confronted. So when they say man, they mean humanity. The Renaissance magical attitude is summed up in Ficino's aphorism, man is the measure of all things. And this is, uh, this is a double-edged sword. Because in a single affirmation, you cast off the guilt trip. You cast off the view of ourselves as a flawed creature. But when you say man is the measure of all things, I mean, you could be the chairman of the board of Louisiana Pacific or Dow Chemical. I mean, this is approximately their attitude. In other words, it ain't rainforests, it's not the life of the earth, it's none of that malarkey. We are to be the measure of all things. So the, it has to be tempered. Uh, we'll probably end up talking a bit here about what is about the pathological expression of the hermetic position, which is called Faustianism. And Faustianism is where you have unbridled ego, unbridled faith in the intellect so that you, uh, you proceed forward without self-doubt. If you haven't read Faust recently, uh, it's a surprising read. Uh, first of all, you know, it's very funny. It's hilarious. It's funnier than any of Shakespeare's plays, I think. And uh, the way it ends is in the guy dedicates himself to uh, land reclamation and the draining of swamps to build low-cost housing for poor people. I mean, people don't know this. They, they're caught up in the images of the center of the story where, you know, magical power is running rampant. But Faust's final conclusion is that he should do some good work for the least of society and give up these uh, Promethean 
and titanic dreams of, uh, of the mastery of power. Well, uh, a little bit of history about this hermetic ideal. It's an interesting story in the light of our discussion of time yesterday. Western civilization, in a way, can be thought of as an accumulated series of misunderstandings. And uh, one of the most severe of these misunderstandings has to do with this whole business of hermeticism. The Renaissance really believed that Hermes Trismegistus was uh, a, a great teacher of antiquity who preceded Moses, who was in time older than Moses. And uh, they, they had what they called um, the Prisci Theologica, the three theologians, and they were Hermes Trismegistus, Moses, and Orpheus in that order. And uh, the reason that, that I say Western civilization is built on a series of misunderstandings is because they got it all wrong about Hermes Trismegistus. And there was great, uh, conf great uh, confusion and unhappiness in the, uh, in the uh, 16th century when Marie Cassabon, who was an early philologist, attacked the dating of the Hermetic corpus and argued correctly that this could not possibly have been written in a period preceding Moses, that in fact this was post-Christian, written no, earl no earlier than the first century A.D., this is the equivalent of us finding out that, uh, you know, George Washington was alive in Greenwich Village in the 1930s or something. I mean, it was a completely mind-bending realignment of how people thought the history of the world had unfolded because they had up to that time thought that um, when you studied Hermes Trismegistus, you were reading the oldest philosopher in human history. Actually, it's very late. And in a way, this is what destroyed the magical uh, alternative. The, the advent of modern philology showed that these so-called ancient texts were not ancient at all. They were late Roman. They were Hellenistic. And uh, so strongly... Uh, was imprinted in the Western mind uh, the what's called, and we've talked about it here this weekend, what's called the nostalgia for paradise. In other words, the belief that the older it is, the better it is. And uh, Guillaume Battista Vico in La Ciencia Nuova laid the basis for this kind of thinking. It's called classicism in the Renaissance context. So once they found out that the Hermetic Corpus had been written in, in late Roman times, it was like it was finished. And, and science was able to use the confusion in the magical community at that point to force its own agenda very strongly. And there, were new, there have been numerous episodes of misplaced dating like this that have contributed to the confusion around the history of magic. For example, and I hope this doesn't bring somebody rising out of their chair in an air-clawing rave, but um, Rosicrucianism rests on a whole bunch of phony dates because they want to tell you that, that uh, somebody named Christian Rosencrantz wrote a book called The Chemical Wedding and uh, sealed it up in a time capsule in the, in the uh, uh, 12th century and that it was then uh, dug up in the uh, 15th, 15th, 16th, dug up in the 16th century. But actually all these Rosicrucian documents 
were ponied up by people in the 16th century who had a very complicated political agenda, which we will probably discuss as part of this, uh, this weekend. Uh, hermetic philosophy is based on what is called the hermetic corpus. This is a group of books, uh, uh, the most important of which is called the Asclepius. And these books, most of them, were completely lost during the Middle Ages. Uh, at the fall of the Roman Empire, copies of these hermetic manuscripts were systematically destroyed by enthusiastic Christian barbarians. And uh, uh, the, her the hermetic manuscripts were scattered and they only survived then in monasteries in Syria and places like that. Well, then in the Renaissance, uh, the Council of Florence, under the patronage of, of uh, the Borgias and people like that, uh, they became very, there was this great interest suddenly in antiquities because these Roman statuary and stuff was coming out of the ground. So the Council of Florence commissioned a character named Gemistus Pletho to go to Syria and bring back these manuscripts. And they established a translation uh, commission. And they had, in manuscript, the, ma the, the works of Plato, the works of Hermes Trismegistus, uh, a whole bunch of ancient literature. And to show you what the psychology of the Renaissance was, here they had Plato, which they hadn't been able to read for a thousand years, sitting there waiting for translation. And uh, um, the, the uh, uh, Cosimo de Medici said to Marcello Ficino, Plato can wait. Translate the Hermetic Corpus first. And so it was done. If you're interested in, in Renaissance Hermeticism, you can't do better than read uh, Dame Frances Yates' book, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition. Well, I want to read you some of this stuff because uh, it's very interesting and it has a, uh, a modernity that is astonishing. It's also very psychedelic. Um, here's a little passage on... Uh, on uh, the imagination. I'm reading from Book 9 of the Corpus Hermeticum in the Scott translation. This is a four-volume set. I only brought the text and translation volume. But uh, if you read Greek, it's all here. If you don't, it's all here in English. Uh, but this will just give you a, a feeling for the approach. If then you do not make yourself equal to God, you cannot apprehend God, for like is known by like. Leap clear of all that is corporeal and make yourself to a like expanse with that greatness which is beyond all measure. Rise above all time and become eternal. Then you will apprehend God. Think that for you too nothing is impossible deem that you too are immortal and that you are able to grasp all things in your thought to know every craft and every science find your home in the haunts of every living creature make yourself higher than all heights and lower than all depths bring together in yourself all opposites of quality heat and cold dryness and fluidity think that you are everywhere at once on land at sea in heaven Think that you are not yet begotten, that you are in the womb, that you are young, that you are old, that you have died, that you are in the world beyond the grave. Grasp in your thought all this at once, all times and places, all substances and qualities and magnitudes together. Then you can apprehend God. But if you shut up your soul in your body and abase yourself and say, I know nothing, I can do nothing, I am afraid of earth and sea. 
I cannot mount to heaven. I know not what I was, nor what I shall be. Then what have you to do with God? Your thought can grasp nothing more than good if you cleave to the body and are evil. Interesting. Very different from the humble yourself, uh, hard labor, spun wool and watery beer approach of medieval uh, Christianity. Um, here's an amazing passage. Uh, you know, people like to think people thought the world was flat until uh, the Renaissance. Uh, this is a, an incredible psychedelic image of outer space that is second century A.D. Would that it were possible for you to grow wings and soar into the air, poised between earth and heaven, you might see the solid earth, the fluid sea and the streaming rivers, the wandering air, the penetrating fire, the courses of the stars, and the swiftness of the movement with which heaven encompasses all. What happiness were that, my son, to see all these borne along with one impulse, and to behold him who is unmoved, moving in all that moves, and him who is hidden, made manifest through his works. And it goes on and on. It's very readable. It's very literary. It's highly poetic. It's a celebration of nature. The notion of sin is completely absent. And it rings with a kind of confidence, a kind of joy that... Uh, was completely running counter to the brimstone and damnation point of view of Christianity. Here's a, uh, a, a uh, to me, a, a psychedelic passage. But he who presents all things to us through our senses and thereby manifest himself through all things and in all things, and especially to those to whom he wills to manifest himself. Begin then, my son taught, with a prayer to the Lord and Father, who alone is good. Pray that you may find favor with him, and that one ray of him, if only one, may flash into your mind, so that you may have power to grasp in thought that mighty being, for thought alone can see that which is hidden, inasmuch as thought itself is hidden from sight. And if even the thought which is within you is hidden from your sight, how can he, being in himself, be manifest to you through your bodily eyes? But if you have power to see with the eyes of the mind, then, my son, he will manifest himself to you. For the Lord manifests himself ungrudgingly through all the universe, and you can behold God's image with your eyes and lay hold on it with your hands. If you wish to see him, think on the sun, think on the course of the moon, think on the order of the stars. Who is it that maintains that order? The sun is the greatest of the gods in heaven. To him as to their king and overlord and all the kings of heaven yield place. And yet this mighty God, greater than earth and sea, submits to having smaller stars circling above him. Who is it then, my son, that he always obeys with reverence and awe? Each of these stars, too, is confined by measured limits and has an appointed space to range in. Why do not all the stars in heaven run like and equal courses? Who is it that is assigned to each its place and marked out for each the extent of its course? And so forth. So it's, uh, it's a nature-oriented, celebratory, it glories in the exercise of the mind. It is not doctrinal. It is not uh, pietistic. It is magical, psychedelic, expansive. And I'm not implying that they used psychedelic substances. The evidence for that is incredibly murky and hard to get at. And probably they didn't. I mean, one of the real tragedies of Western history is that Western Europe is so poor in psychoactive plants. I mean, had, had uh, Western Europe 
stayed in touch with the mystery religions of ancient Greece, Christianity would never have been able to force its agenda to the degree that it did. I think you can make an argument that uh, there were psychedelic mysteries in Europe probably up until the time of the fall of Eleusis. Uh, Hermeticism is only one heterodox strain among many that were in existence in Europe in the late Roman period and that then partially survived into the Dark Ages. I mean, you have uh, Neoplatonism, which is uh, a group of philosophers in the in the third and fourth century who uh, Plotinus, Porphyry, Proclus, and that crowd, and they took Plato, the late Plato, and contorted that into uh, a mystical doctrine of uh, emanation. They were what are called emanationists. What this means is you start with it's either called the one or the unnameable or Brahman Atman or something like that. And then you have a series of declensions into more and more material and more and more multiplistic expressions of being. These Neoplatonists were emanationists and their theories about how the universe is constructed have become sort of the unconscious basis of all later magical speculation. Uh, if they are the people who brought the angels into the picture so, so intensely because they were trying to create a descending hierarchy of being from the most high down to the most low. And angels, once set in place, uh, became a real problem for Christianity because they are... Um, not very easy to distinguish from the old stellar demons of the of paganism. Paganism was largely the belief that uh, the power of the stars could be drawn down to earth through a series through sympathetic magic, really, uh, by setting up resonances in a ritual situation you could draw the power of the stars down into your projects and your intentions. And uh, the late Middle Ages was a period of uh, intensely working out all the associations between uh, minerals, colors, perfumes, plants, musical uh, notes and, uh, uh, you know, styles so that you could then bring together all these things for purposes of magical evocation. And if any of you are interested in this, the, the book to read, which will point you toward many other interesting books, is a, a wonderful book called Spiritual and Demonic Magic from Ficino to Campanella. Some of you may remember Campanella Hell of a fighter. Anyway. Hello? <laughs> and uh, in the Renaissance, you know, over a period of about three generations, uh, this became a real problem because what starts out as angel magic ends up as out and out demonic conjuration something which I've noticed my 14-year-old son has an incredibly unhealthy interest in, uh, which I did as well at his age. I hope it's not the family curse uh, <laughs> coming back. Um, yeah, so I mentioned the dating error. It was Lactantius, uh, who was one of the fathers of the early church, one of, of the patristic writers. That's that generation of theologians uh, that followed Christ who canonized the Christian religion. And he placed uh, 
he placed Hermes Trismegistus as older than Moses, older than Pythagoras, older than Plato, and uh, uh, and then it wasn't until uh, Marie Casabon corrected that problem. See, we forget how the the really transformative uh, breakthrough that was represented for Western Europe by the recovery of all of this ancient literature. It had been completely lost. Uh, and also a, a misimpression that probably needs correcting is I think most people who are not schooled in Western history think that the further back in time the more quote-unquote superstitious people were. This isn't actually the case. It isn't a case of the further back in time you go, the more belief in demons, magical conjuration, and stuff like that you get. Uh, the uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries in Europe were periods of remarkable piety and intellectual cohesion. Of course, it was also some kind of a fascist nightmare. That's how they achieved it. They had stamped out paganism. They had pushed heresy and heterodox thinking to the very distant frontiers of the empire, uh, of the, you know, the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, uh, people were not superstitious. And people were not obsessed with horoscopes and conjuration and this sort of thing. Where that all began was, uh, well, or where it reached its culmination is in the 16th century. The 16th century, the 1500s, it was the most magical obsessed century in the last 10. And alchemy and uh, conjuration and talismanic magic and uh, sympathetic magic, all of these things flourished really uh, not as a um, throwback, but as a kind of prelude to modern science. Modern science is an incredibly demonic enterprise. And we will see as we discuss this stuff that in a in curious and little, rarely discussed way, the program, uh, the agenda of, of magical dissidents in Europe have been entirely achieved by the forces of what we call modernity. It's simply that it has been done in an entirely secular metaphor. I mean, if you take even the, the trivial belief about alchemists, that they were concerned with changing lead into gold. And of course, that isn't what it was about. But there were plenty of con artists running around on the periphery of these deeper scenes who were claiming they could change lead into gold. Well, in the 20th century, we routinely change lead to gold. You do it with neutron bombardment in particle accelerators. And of course, it costs far more to do it than the worth of the gold that you get out. But that really wasn't the point, was it? It was to prove that it could be done. Uh, the dreams of creating the homunculus uh, are dreams that dovetail directly into the aspirations of modern biology, genetics, so forth and so on. Uh, the, the great chain of being of Aristotle is animated, given a dimension of motion, and lo and behold, it becomes the Darwin-Wallace theory of evolution. Uh, the, uh, Mersiliad talks about this, about how all the alchemical dreams of the 15th and 16th century have been brought to fruition in the 20th century, but again, in the absence of magical rhetoric but certainly in a spirit of magical and Faustian recklessness, for sure. I mean, this is scientists, you know, they claim such a devotion to truth that decency 
must never stand in the way because they serve a higher God than human values. They serve uh, the golem of the truth in some weird way that makes the truth okay even if it kills you. I studied philosophy from Paul Feyerabend and he used to say at the beginning of his Epistemology 101 course, I will teach you to recognize the truth and I will teach you to ask the question, what's so great about it? You know, I mean, so now you've got the truth. So what's so great about it? Uh, it was 1460 when these manuscripts were brought to Florence. Those of you with photographic memories can see the time wave signature as it turns over and heads through the floor. Uh, and. Uh, the um, Cosimo de Medici immediately ordered Pacino to abandon his work on, Pletho, on uh, Plato and, uh, and the Pymander, which was one of these uh, uh, books which had been, it was the only one which existed in Europe, uh, even in partial form during the Dark Ages. Uh, uh, Cosimo died in, in 1464, but the translation project uh, went forward and uh, just so you understand the the tree the developmental process in Western magic goes basically all goes back to this Florentine translation project and from there people who were well placed got a hold of this stuff the most important person probably being uh, uh, a person, certainly an unsung hero in the development of Western thought, Trithemius, Bishop of Sponheim. And Trithemius uh, wrote a book. He was really a manuscript. It was never printed as a book in his lifetime, but later, called the Stenographica. And in it, he put forth many of these magical doctrines and also encryption methods for code making and breaking so that this stuff could be circulated under the eyes of the clergy without uh, causing a problem. And then the, the development of Western magic splits into two strains. Uh, the Bruno strain, Giordano Bruno. I understand he's running for president of the United States this year. Giordano Bruno and his school, he was a Franciscan monk who ended up being burned at the stake. His sin for which he was burned at the stake was he was sitting on a rooftop of one of these Italian city-states one evening, presumably smoking some pretty decent boo that they'd brought in from North Africa. And uh, he was looking at the stars and he, it occurred to him, these things are suns. These little points of light are like the sun. Jesus Christ! And in a single moment, the universe became infinite. And he said, if these are suns, and he just, you know, his mind was boggled, literally. I mean, can you imagine inside the medieval worldview where they have these concentric shells of angels and demons and the, all this, suddenly this guy gets it in a single moment and he sees that the universe is infinite and he begins to say so. And this is against Aristotle. And uh, the church just goes nuts and they drive him out of Italy and he has a whole bunch of adventures in England and other places. Eventually, he makes the mistake of coming back to a place in northern Italy where he's betrayed by his patron, and he is uh, he's burned at the stake for a point of view which all of us take quite for granted. The other uh, strain of magic coming down from Trithemius is the D strain. And it is a bit more accessible to people like ourselves because John Dee was an Englishman and he wrote in English. And so you don't have to conquer uh, 16th century Italian or uh, 
or late Latin in order to read him, although he wrote a lot in Latin as well. D is a very interesting character worth spending some time on because D is the last person to be able to unify into one worldview uh, science and mathematics and magic and astrology uh, all together. So he is the greatest magician of his age and the greatest scientist of his age. He designed the navigation instruments that Sir Francis Drake used to go around uh, the, uh, the Cape Horn and sail up the coast of California. He, did, he was a, an intelligence operative serving Queen Elizabeth uh, on the European continent. He could cast the best horoscope in Europe, and that was his entree into these various royal families of these various capital cities of Europe. And then he was, you know, making maps of, of battlements and of the deployment of war facilities and shipbuilding capacity and stuff like that, and sending it all back to Elizabeth uh, in these codes that he had learned from Trithemius, not personally, but from the Stenographica. And D, uh, a very strange incident happened, which was uh, on a cold day in April at his house in Mortlake, which is on the outskirts of London. Now it's completely surrounded by modern London. Uh, I should say, he had, he had the largest library in England. He had 6,000 books. Sir Philip Sidney and the Queen would occasionally call upon him to shoot the bull. And uh, he, he was a very learned man. So one day in April of 1582, he's working at his desk at his room in Mortlake, and he goes outside. He's, there's some disturbance in the garden, and he goes outside. And his story, and we have only his story, is that an angel descended in a ball of light and gave him an object which is uh, to this day on exhibit in the British Museum. Uh, if you ever have a chance, it's worth hunting it down. It's in the Renaissance Hall. And it's, uh, it's a piece of black polished obsidian uh, roughly about this big and about that thick and very highly polished. It, he called it the Shoe Stone, S-H-E-W. And it, what the deal was, was you could look into the Shoe Stone, if you had the right talent, and you, it was a magical theater. There were gods and demons and uh, female spirits and all kinds of things swirling around this thing. Well, for the next uh, many years, the showstone was the major guiding force on Dee's life. And a guy came to him named Edward Kelly. And Edward Kelly, uh, legend has it that he had no ears, which in England at that time meant that you had committed some infraction in the province and they had removed your ears. It was the mark of a con artist. Uh, was so you couldn't fool anybody else. They took your ears off. So then if you met somebody with no ears and a big scheme, you knew to keep your wallet in your pocket. So, so this guy Kelly had an immense facility with this showstone. I mean, he could just sit down with it. And it is one of the most puzzling and undiscussed episodes in the evolution of Western thought. The straight people just say, whoa, this is a bunch of crap. You know, this guy, Kelly. First of all, Dee was married to a much younger woman named Anne Dee. And at one point in the ten years or so that Dee and Kelly were together, the angels of the showstone uh, gave very explicit instructions that Dee should allow Kelly to... Uh, God's will, it was done, he says. 
<laughs> in his diary. So this guy was a sharpie for sure. <clears throat> However, it's it, it's very puzzling because if he was if he was a con artist, he must have been a con artist of immense uh, cleverness because often the way the D angels would work is they would deliver very, very long messages in Latin backwards. And Kelly, Kelly would just dictate this stuff at a very rapid speed, and D would write it down, and then they would put away the show stone, and then they would very laboriously rewrite this stuff from back to front, and then there would be these long, coherent harangues about what they should be doing, about which courtly figures they should uh, support with money and who should be introduced to who. It was very political, you know? Well, what kind of a polymathic talent was Edward Kelly that he could invert whole pages of Latin and reel it off and then have it be reconstructed and make sense? Also, there are, you see, this. we know about this because Dee kept a diary over the years that this was all going on. It's one of the most astonishing books in all of English literature. And until the last ten years, the 1658 edition was the only edition ever published. Uh, it's called A True and Faithful Relation, or in full, a true and faithful relation of what passed for many years between Dr. D and some spirits with the annotation by Marie Casabon, the guy who did the correct dating on the Hermetica. Uh, and it, it's very interesting reading. It's, a, as I say, one of the most puzzling instant, uh, incidents in the whole history of science. What D was doing was eventually he came to rest at the court of Rudolf II, Rudolf I of, of Bohemia, who ruled from Prague. Now, you have to understand, is that a hand up? Yeah. yeah. Is there evidence of uh, drug use? Not strong enough to, to uh, warrant any getting thrilled about it. Uh, the great awareness of drug use came slightly later, uh, and strangely enough, uh, the drug was opium. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's interesting, the history of opium. You know, we think of, of uh, opium and its derivatives, uh, junk and heroin, as just the lowest, well, maybe crack is now the lowest of the low, but anyway, it's a real scuzzball drug, according to most people's opinion. But did you know that no, they had been using opium for 3,000 years before anybody noticed that it was an addicting drug? It was not ever noted that opium was addicting until 1611 when John Playfair, a very famous English physician, wrote a book in which he commented on opium and said, uh, once one has begun the habit of opium, it must be maintained unto death. Uh, so, uh, in, the, in the 30 years after D, there was a great hermeticist and alchemical thinker named Paracelsus who arose on the European continent. Paracelsus is an interesting guy. He's essentially the inventor of drugs because he was the first person to extract herbs and to get this notion of the essence, that, there's, that if you have a medicinal plant, then there's something in there which you want to get out and concentrate. He called his school of, of uh, alchemy iatrochemistry, the doctor's chemistry, and he invented pills of the ordinary sort and uh, and uh, he said I have made a great discovery the center of my alchemical opus rests with the magic of laudanum which was of course 
Gamaltium. Uh, there, there was a craze in the late 15th century among alchemists for opium. The, the alchemist von Helmuth, uh, he, he signed some of his alchemical tracts, Dr. Opiatus. He, he was uh, the first croaker.